So I mentioned about the bulletin not being sent out. I wasn't scheduled to speak today. Our brother, Elder Mark Johnson, was going to speak today. So throughout the week, we send information to the office, and Karen does a fantastic job, her and some volunteers, putting the bulletin together and doing those things. And then she gets it ready for Sunday morning, and she emails that out and everything. But uh, Thursday, midday, in the morning, Mark calls me and says, Hey, brother, I'm not feeling too good. Uh, don't know what's going on, but out of an abundance of caution, I'm not going to be at church on Sunday. So he called Karen, and so we had to kind of put a pause on sending out the, the bulletin in that. And so, Mark, I know you're watching. I wish you were here. brother. But, um, so I didn't plan a sermon today, but God did. Amen. So um, today you get the wider version of my brother, Mark Johnson. Okay. <laughs> Look, not all men, God created us the same. We're not all tall, dark, and handsome. Okay. <laughs> Mark got two of the three. And if you're wondering, I've all, I've, which one I got, I was asked God why he didn't give me height. You know, so you can figure out which one of the other two I got. But God is good. And um, we get to gather and worship and glorify his name. And you know what Mark did is what we've been asking people to do. We take every precaution to keep ourselves and everyone safe here. We have temperature checks when you come in. We have masks. And if you come to church and you forget a mask, we have masks available for you. We have the chairs and the rows separated. We come in one door, out another door. Everything is sanitized throughout the week and after the uses. So we do all the things to be able to keep ourselves safe and make this a safe place for us to come and gather and worship together. And, you know, Praise God that those who have had to deal with the infection, this, this virus, um, have received it or have gotten infected through other means other than gathering here. The Spirit of God has been working and keeping us safe. And so we're going to continue to do those things to keep ourselves safe so that we can get, gather together here and be able to worship and glorify God. And that's why Mark isn't here. He got tested yesterday. I don't know what the results are, but... You know, we're going to keep Brother Mark and others who are dealing with different things in prayer so that God would have uh, mercy on them and bring them to be with us here uh, as soon as possible. The message today, I spoke a little bit about this on Friday afternoon because we had had a service for our sister uh, Socorro Gonzalez who had passed away and her family, um, uh, beautiful family. And keep that family in prayer, the Gonzalez family, because they're going through a lot right now with the loss of their loved one. But I spoke a little bit about that, and that's the sermon that we're going to talk about today. You know, for over or about a year now, the world has been dealing with this, this virus, with this pandemic. And the numbers are staggering. The number of people who have passed away because of COVID-19. We're never going to know what that actual number is. But there's two things that we do know. That it is real. It is happening. It's not some myth. It's not some conspiracy. It is happening. It is real. And that it has impacted everybody on this planet. In some form or fashion, this virus has impacted us. Now, you may say, that, David, I, I haven't been sick. Nobody in my family has been sick. I don't personally know anyone who's been sick. But it has impacted everybody. Try going out to eat. Try going to a store. When was the last time someone went to a movie? Who went to a concert recently? Or a play? Or have you gone to your children's school activities. To some degree, this has impacted everybody. And in this story that we're going to read today, it's an event that impacted this family that they didn't expect, they didn't plan for, 
They didn't know what was going to happen, but things happen in life. And this family is going through a tragic moment that they didn't expect to happen. And it's comforting for me and for us to see how God worked and how God was revealed in the middle of that storm and that unexpected situation. Things happen. And many times we don't understand and we don't know why. And as I said before, times that we don't agree with it and don't like it. But we have to believe and trust that God is in control and that he's using those things and working those things out. And this situation that happened in this family not only affected that family, but it affected the extended family and the entire community was impacted by what happened. If you're able, would you please stand as we read this morning in the book of John, chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1, excuse me, 21 through 26. The word of God says, Lord, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You may be seated. This story has a lot of lessons for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Because it helps us understand in a real and tangible way how much God loves us. And it helps us see how much, again, Jesus loves each and every one of us. You know, sometimes I think that people, when they hear about Jesus and when people read about Jesus, that they think that maybe he wasn't affected by the things that we go through. They say, well, he was a son of God. He was in heaven and he came and he did miracles. And he fed thousands and he spoke to nature. He spoke to storms. He spoke to demons. He healed the sick. He did all these things. He walked on water and, and that maybe because he was the son of God, somehow he was like above the things that we feel. This story helps us understand that he feels what we feel, that he goes through the things that we go through, that he knows the pain and the suffering that we feel when things happen in this life, that when we grieve, he grieves with us, that he knows what we are going through. And that should resonate with us, and it should help us understand that he, he's there. In the middle of all that, God is there with us. Because you can say he's walked a mile in our shoes. He has experienced it. During the ministry of Christ, he had been preaching and teaching and telling people about the way to honor God the Father speaking about the kingdom of God and a, a way to be able to worship and live a life honorable to God. And he was talking about the kingdom of God and he was leading his people to God the Father. That all the things that had been foretold, all the things that had been prophesied, all the practices that the old customs and traditions that the Jewish people had followed were all pointing to him and that he had come to fulfill all that and to lead his people to God, to make a way for us to be restored to God the Father, that he was going to shepherd his people back to God. And because of this, because he was preaching this and teaching this, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, and the people of the day wanted to kill him. In fact, in the previous chapter, there is this confrontation that happens where they have stones and they want to stone him to death, not because he was healing people, not because he was doing miracles, not because he was having signs and wonders, but because he was saying that he was the son of God, because he had proclaimed to be the shepherd of God's people. 
In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 11, he says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. What he is saying is that I have come to lead the people who believe in me, who believe in God, and I'm going to lead them to God the Father. And I am so dedicated, I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to give my life so that they who believe in me can live. And for this, they wanted to kill him. But in the midst of all of that, the scripture tells us that Jesus slips away. Because it wasn't time and it wasn't the way and how God was going to work that out. And now we find the story of Lazarus and his family. The story of Lazarus and his family, there's Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They had met Jesus. We find it in the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke. They had met Jesus. They would heard Jesus. And they would welcomed Jesus into their home. Jesus knew them. Jesus had befriended them, you can say. And they became very familiar. And they became very, very close. And now there's a situation where Lazarus becomes sick. And Martha and Mary know what to do. They send word to Jesus. He's nearby, and they send word to Jesus for him to come because he's healed other people. He has saved other people. He's done all these miracles, and so their faith and trust is that if he's, gonna, if he's there, then this situation will be taken care of. And this is how they send word to him. In John eleven three. 3, it says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, that's an interesting way to describe someone. The one you love. Because the Bible tells us that God loves everybody. For God so loved the world. He loves all of us. So does it mean that Lazarus was a little bit more special than others? Does it mean that Lazarus was held a higher place in God's heart, in Jesus' heart? Not at all. I think what it's showing us is that Lazarus is a picture of man's condition. That Lazarus was a, a picture for us of our hearts that are sick unto death. That our spirits are in need of healing. That we are spiritually dead and sick. And that there are people praying for the lost, praying for those who need Jesus. And are saying, Lord, the one you love, my brother, my sister, my mother, my friend, my father, my co-worker, my cousin. Those people are sick and they need you. And so, it, to me, it's a picture for us to look at. Our sinful nature means we are sick spiritually. And that that sickness leads to death, eternal death. And it has been like that since the beginning of time. Since the fall of man, that is what has happened. We weren't created to be sick. We weren't created to feel pain, to suffer, to grieve. We were created in the image of God, perfect, in a perfect relationship with him, until sin came and severed that. And since then, we have been sick. Our hearts have been in a corrupt state. And we continue to decay and continue to go down this path that leads to eternal death if we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In Genesis chapter 6, this is how God saw the situation. Verse 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness had become on the earth, and that every inclination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. God looks down and he sees that men's hearts are sick and troubled and evil, and the condition is getting worse. But that's not God's desire for us to be in that state. That's not God's desire for us to live that way. God wants us to be healthy, to be good, to be restored, to be made right. And it only is possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We see a picture of God's desire in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 5, verse 29, when it says, this is God speaking, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Amen. The fear he's talking about is not to be afraid. Again, it's to be in awe, to be amazed, to not have words to describe how great and awesome God's love is for man, that he wants us to be restored to him, and by doing so, things will go well. Not only for us, but for our children as we teach our children to follow God and to seek after God and to seek after his ways. 
That is God's desire for you and for me and for all mankind. That is God's desire for the world because he loves us. Now, Martha and Mary send word because their brother has died or their brother is sick. And when they send word, word goes to Jesus and Jesus doesn't go. He doesn't go quickly. He doesn't show up when they wanted him to show up. In fact, the Bible says that he delayed, that he waited. You know, we sometimes want God to do things our way, in our timetable, how we want and think it should be done. We get impatient. We get antsy. We get a little anxious. We start getting a little bit worried because God isn't showing up when we need him to. You know, we need to remember that we need to rejoice in God and in his ways and in his timing. In fact, that is what Paul, when he wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 and 7, he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And because we sometimes don't get it the first time, he says it again. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. What he is saying there, do you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, when everything is going wrong, rejoice. When you're in the middle of a storm, rejoice. When the doctor gives us a bad diagnosis, rejoice. When things at work don't seem like they're going the way they should go, rejoice. When society is going crazy in chaos, rejoice. When it seems that the enemy is laughing at you, rejoice in the Lord, because God is in the middle of that situation. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't decided he's going to go do something else. He's already there, and he was there before you got there. In the middle of the storm, rejoice. Just make your prayers and supplications, make your requests known to God. Why? Because God is near. And Paul says, you know, through that, And the peace of God, and who is the peace of God? That is Christ himself. The peace of God will be in your hearts and your minds, and you will be at peace knowing that although this is difficult, although this is hard, although this is painful, I'm not going through this alone because Jesus is with me, and he is helping me get through this. And whatever is happening, in the end, it's going to be all right. Martha she hears that the Lord is near. And so she goes out to see him. She goes out. She leaves the house. She leaves the area. And she goes out to where he's at. And this is what she says. She says, Lord, if you had come, my brother would not have died. Now, I wasn't there. And we don't have any audio recordings of the context or the, uh, would you say, the voice or the attitude of Martha when she said this. But... She probably would have said, Lord, if you would have been here, this wouldn't happen. If you would have came when I called you, my brother wouldn't be dead. If, Lord, you would have, and I think sometimes as Christians, we do that. We say, Lord, if you would have shown up when I asked you to, if you would have been there when I first started praying about this, if you would have come when I saw this happening, We wouldn't be going through this. We wouldn't be having this problem. I wouldn't be suffering this. I wouldn't have to deal with this. My family wouldn't have to be going through this. Lord, if you had come when we wanted you to. But the way Jesus responds to her, out of compassion, out of love, trying to reassure her, he says, Martha, your brother will live again. She goes, I know I got it in the resurrection, down the road, it's going to happen. I understand that we can cross that bridge when we get to it. But right now, I am in the middle of this situation, and I don't like it. If you would have come, I wouldn't be going through this. 
She's saying, right now, what I'm, going, I'm dealing with is what I'm concerned. I know something's going to happen down there, but right now is what I'm angry about. Remember, we need to rejoice. Even in the difficult times, rejoice. Even in the hard times, we have to just trust that God is in total control. And then Jesus tells her in verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. Even though he dies, and whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He saying, Martha, it's all right. Martha, I got this. Martha, I'm in control. Martha, I have your back. I'm there. I'm in the middle of it. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. I know the pain. I know the struggle. I know the suffering. I know the sorrow and the grief. I understand it, Martha. But do you believe in who I am? That's the question that he's giving to her. And we may wonder why all this is going on right now. We've been, people may be wondering, what does this pandemic mean? What does all this hardship mean? What does all this pain mean? What, what is all of this? Where is God in all of this? He is right in the middle of all of this. And he always has been. Later, Mary says the same thing. She says, Lord, if you would have, we wouldn't be going through this. And I don't know how you feel. But when you read this entire story, there's this very short verse that we read that is reassuring to me, that gives me comfort. And it's verse 35, where it simply says, Jesus wept. We see the humanity. We see that he feels what we feel. We see that he, he understands what we are going through. And he cries. And he feels that. Now, he had asked, where have you laid him? And they took him to where Lazarus' body had been laid. And the Bible says that he saw the family and the grief, and he saw the community and the people and how sorrowful they were, and it disturbed him. It, it really hurt him, and he cried. But the encouraging part is what he did after that. The reassuring part is that he goes and stands in front of the tomb where Lazarus' dead body had been placed. And with a loud voice calls him out by name and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that Lazarus emerges out of that tomb bound from head to toe in grave clothes, but he is alive. He is alive because Jesus, the resurrection, is there. And it's a, it's a reminder to all of us that even though we may have had loved ones or friends that have passed on, one day those who have believed in Jesus Christ are going to come and be alive again. And it's a reminder for us that we too will live forever because Jesus is our life and resurrection. We can say all oh, the Lord if you had that we want. If you had done this. If you would have been there. If you would have changed this. We can say all those things, but we need to remember that he is the sovereign God and that he is in total control and that whatever situation or circumstance I am going through or you're going through or our loved one is going through, he is with them as well and he knows what they are going through. And we also have to understand that one day very soon, one day Jesus is coming back again, and he is going to come for all who believed in him. And as Thessalonians tells us in chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that... Those of us who are still alive and are left behind will be caught up together to be with him, to meet him in the clouds, and will be with the Lord forever. He is our life and our resurrection. Mary and Martha saying, Lord, if you would have been here. And Jesus saying, oh, I have been there. I know. And I'm telling you, it's going to be all right because I am the life and I am the resurrection. But do you believe that is what he's saying? 
Again, in verse 25 and 26, he says, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. And the question he asks, sir, is a question that is, we are being asked as well. Do you believe this? Do you believe that he is our resurrection, our life, and our hope? If we believe that, the question for us or what we should be saying is not, Lord, if you had. What we should be saying is, Lord is. Lord is my redeemer. Lord is my strength. Lord is my refuge. Lord is my strong tower. Lord is my helper. Lord is my healer. Lord is my God, my life, my resurrection, my salvation. He is God. He is the first and the last. He was the one who was, is, and forever will be. And no matter what happens in this life, he is our resurrection and our eternal life. Last week, I'll share this in closing. Last week, if you were here, you got a cupcake. At the end of service, we celebrated 30 years by giving out cupcakes. And after we left, there was only a few of us here. Ed was here. Uh, a couple of folks that were still here. And I was in my car with my son, Nathan. We're getting ready to drive out, holding my cupcake. <laughs> Chocolate cupcake with that white frosting. <laughs> Delicious. And I was getting ready to leave, and I thought, you know, I wonder if there's any cupcakes left. Because I'm going to see if there's one left, and I'm going to take one to my, my wife, Debbie. So I tell my son, I'm going to go back, and Ed's still there to see. So we drove back over here. And there was a couple of gentlemen that were young guys that were out there and kind of hanging around. And what had happened is that they saw people walking out with cupcakes, and they had asked Ed, hey, can we get a cupcake? And Ed said, yeah, hang out, and I'll get you guys a cupcake, because it was extras. So my son came in, and I was sitting in the car waiting for my son to come back up. And as I'm waiting, these two gentlemen come up to me, and they said, hey, um, I'm sorry, we're late, we missed church. What was it about? What was church about? And I said, well, we spoke about Jesus Christ being our redeemer, that we are redeemed through the blood of Christ. And he said, so, yeah, so what did they say? What does that mean? And so I said, well, it means that because Jesus came and gave his life for us, we now can live forever with him. And also, we can be made perfect. I said, well, yeah, we're, we will be perfect. Not while we're here. But if we accept Jesus Christ, we go on that path. And so for the next 15 minutes or so, we were talking back and forth. And then I finally said, I said, let me ask you something. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? That he came from heaven and he gave his life and on the third day rose and that he's now in heaven and that because of what he did, we can be saved. And he says, yeah, I believe. And I said, well, what about you? Because there was two of them. I said, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died for your sins? And he says, yes. And I said, well, if you both believe, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Do you accept Jesus Christ? Praise God, we have Brother T and Brother J who now accepted Jesus Christ. And they will live forever with him because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and he is our life. He is our hope. And in the middle of the struggles, in the middle of the hardships, in the middle of whatever we may be going through, our hope lies in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Praise God. Would you please join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you, Lord, that there is hope and that that hope is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, many people are going through some hard, hard times right now. Pain and grief and sorrow, difficulty and challenges that they did not expect to happen at this time in their life. We plan for all kinds of things in our lives. And throughout the year, we plan for events with our families and with the seasons, different things we're going to do. 
But we don't plan for the hardships. We don't plan for those things that come that bring grief and sorrow and pain. And Father, we want to bring those things to you. I pray for each and every one who is here. Those who are watching, those who will watch later, who might be hurting, who might feel broken, who might feel ashamed, who might feel that that they don't know where to go. That Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would minister to them and just console them right now and let them know that there is hope, that there is an answer, that there is joy, and it is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Father, that instead of us asking what you could have done, Lord, that we just thank you for what you did do. And that is come and pay a price that we could not pay so that our pain and suffering can be taken from us, placed on you, and your joy and your salvation and your grace and your mercy could be given to us. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be ministering in our hearts and minds right now. And that, Lord, if we're holding things back, we would just lay them at the foot of the cross. Give them to you and rejoice because you are in total control. And that we are not going through the battle or the storm alone. You are holding us in your hands. You are carrying us through. And we need to wait upon you to answer that prayer, to take us to the other side, to give us the victory, to bring you honor and glory. Thank you for your word today, Father. Jesus, thank you for coming and being our resurrection and being our life and making a way for us to be restored once again to God the Father. It is in your name we pray. Amen and amen.